For those of you who do not know me, my name is Molly Herman. I'm the Senior Associate Director for Alumni Engagement here at Northeastern University. I want to take this opportunity to welcome and thank our alumni, parents, friends, colleagues, and robots for attending this evening's event. I also want to thank our virtual attendees who are logged in from around the world in order to participate in this unique opportunity to meet Valkyrie. Tonight's event is a perfect example of how Northeastern continues to rise to extraordinary heights and garner, garner recognition as one of the world's foremost research universities. Professor Taskin Padilla, who you will hear from shortly, truly exemplifies the initiative that it takes to achieve a high level of success, and he continues to blaze a trail for his colleagues across many fields of study. Events like this represent a great opportunity to discover the amazing cutting edge interdisciplinary work being conducted by Northeastern students and faculty, not only here on campus, but around the globe. This is also an excellent opportunity to meet fellows of your Northeastern community who share not only your technological interests, but also your affinity for your university. I truly hope to see all of you at another one of our alumni events in the near future. So without further ado, I would like you to join me in welcoming an expert in modeling and control of robotic systems, an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering, and the leader of our Northeastern Valkyrie research team, Taskin Padir. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, good evening. Welcome to Psychology 101. <laughs> um, no, welcome to, welcome to this presentation. Uh, we are excited to have you here. Um, in case you missed it, Valkyrie, everybody, everybody, Valkyrie. Um, I'm not going to take too much time, only about a you know, couple hours or so. You know, we'll, we'll talk about you know, what kind of research problems we will be tackling through this program. You know, how did we get here? Um, but definitely, uh, I want to tell you um, the story so that you, um, you um, leave the room with an understanding of what we are trying to accomplish in the coming days, weeks, years, and so on. Um, so this is the official title for the, um, for the uh, project. But let's start with uh, introductions. So I'm here presenting on behalf of an entire team. Uh, including the professors, um, myself. Uh, Robert Platt is another Northeastern University professor. He's in the College of um, Computer and Information Sciences. He's currently actually at NASA uh, down in Houston attending an event, so he, uh, he couldn't be here. And then we have our collaborator, Holly Yanko, and I'll put her on the spot. She is sitting right there, over there. You know, Holly is at um, uh, UMass Lowell, and we are the also known as profs. But then there are the makers of the team. Uh, those are the students. And I you know, captured this picture. This is an, an old picture. It doesn't um, have everybody. And of course, professors have to be on every single picture as well. Uh, this is the team that went to Johnson Space Center early in, earlier in January, uh, got trained on this. But uh, we have a huge team. And uh, actually, if you want to put some faces, you know, see all the uh, people with uh, black t-shirts over there. They've been, ha uh, they've been working on this um, hard for the past few days to make the event possible. And then we have others um, among the audience you know, who are uh, looking forward to contributing to this program in the coming um, uh, days. There's another set of people that I would like to acknowledge, and I call them our inspirers. So again, I'm going to tell you a story tonight, and the story goes, you know, how did we get here? You know, how did Valkyrie um, came to uh, Massachusetts, Boston, you know, Northeastern, and UMass Lowell? Um, and, and what are we trying to do with ro robots, right? So inspirers are people have, uh, who have difficult tasks at hand, right? So firefighters, uh, individuals with disabilities, or a, a, a medical doctor who is working in an Ebola tent, uh, or an astronaut, for the sake of exploration, lives a safe environment and goes out to unknowns, right? So uh, these are, you know, sometimes I call them heroes of our labs, our, uh, you know, research, but they are definitely our inspirers. Um, 
I will specifically talk about astronauts today because that's uh, why we are we are gathered, and this is this is the idea. Um, here's a picture of a, a real picture from Mars and an astronaut who I don't know. Uh, I am looking forward to meeting an astronaut, you know, very soon. We met uh, several in the past, but um, the idea is NASA is planning um, manned missions to Mars in the 2030s. Okay. Uh, we, you know, myself and several of my students attended um, uh, the IEEE Aerospace Conference earlier this year. Uh, there are plans, talks, discussions. That's the next frontier in space exploration. Now, going to Mars is not easy. You know, we've been to the moon. Uh, we regularly go up to the International Space Station, but those are short-term missions uh, you know, a few days on the moon, you know, be accomplished. But going to Mars will take much longer time. And when, once they go there, you know, they're not going to spend a few hours and come back, right? So they will, they would like to really explore right, and learn more about um, what's there. So the idea is robotic assets, you know, robots like Valkyrie, uh, can be part of the pre-deployment missions. You know, what's the pre-deployment mission? You know, we already have robots on Mars, right? But in, in, uh, in advance of manned missions, um, NASA might want to say, OK, let's pre-deploy habitats. Let's pre-deploy um, Mars ascent vehicles. Let's send more rovers, and so on and so forth. And they wait for the astronauts to come. And I asked the question uh, to, uh, to people that I talked to about the project, you know, what happens if you don't start your car for two years? Do you expect that you know you come back you know you, you walk in and then turn the key and then it's going to go? Probably not. You know, most likely not, right? So the idea is robot systems like Valkyrie will be able to maintain the equipment that's that goes to Mars in advance of the astronauts. And um, again, the timeline is not tomorrow. The timeline is not next year. The timeline is sometime in the next 20 years or so. So it's exciting. You know, we are just starting to scratch the surface of what we can do with the, with the um, humanoid robots. Uh, and that's where the story begins, actually. Now that you have some information on the context, I, know I would like to uh, get started. And I'll take you um, Back, you know, we'll we'll start moving towards backwards, and so that you have an idea about you know how we got here, um, how um, multidisciplinary teams of engineers and scientists can come together to make things happen uh, using robotics technology. But by the way, I mean if uh, if you didn't realize this, I'm a true believer that you know one day robots will be game changers in our lives. Okay, so um, Roombas are already cleaning the floor. Uh, robots will help us with, um, uh, with taking care of our elderly, with manufacturing, with productivity, and so on and so forth. So you know, robots will be everywhere. You know, if, if, if you have a doubt about that, you know, see me after the, after the presentation and we can have a uh, discussion. So let's go back in time. And uh, my big disclaimer here is, and you know, my students and my collaborators know, although I'm giving the presentation here, I'm the face of the presentation, this is the story of many men and women who contributed to these projects, to these uh, programs that I was involved with in the past um, um, five plus years. So I'll take you to two weeks ago. Uh, this is the New England Robotics Validation Ex and Experimentation Center at uh, UMass Lowell in Lowell, Massachusetts. And this was the very first test that, one of the very first tests that we ran um, on the robot. Um, we took a few steps with the robot. And then we said, okay, what happens if the robot is holding on to something? There's nothing there. You know, don't try to look for it. You know, it, fictitiously, it's, it's pretending that it's holding on to so something. Can we take further steps? Right? Can we move around and, and um, um, plan motions around it? Now, when a human does this, you know, when we walk around, when we hold on to a ra railing as we climb down the stairs, we don't think about it, right? So our systems, you know, um, uh, but for a robot to be able to do this, we have to consider a lot, of, a lot of aspects, right? So there's an algorithm that's running the balancing, right? So that robot doesn't fall. How many of you think that this robot never falls? 
great because it falls a lot. <laughs> um, and then it's also trying to maintain its hand position, right, at that, you know, whatever that task is. Um, and it's also trying to take steps to go around it. Now, um, I will take you maybe a week earlier than this. And where do we start, right? We start with simulating. We start with understanding the math and science behind the whole aspect of walking, manipulating, uh, and so on, and we say, let's run this in our simulators. You know, let's first have a, fa you know, have a, have a good um, understanding of the algorithms that we are developing in simulation, because if, if it doesn't work in simulation, it will never work on the real robot. If it works in simulation, it might, but probably won't work uh, on the actual robot for the first time, because simulators are only as good as we make them. But the idea is, and you see the development process, right? So I'm just giving you a snapshot of what it takes to develop capabilities with this robot. I will take you back uh, maybe a month and a week. Uh, this was the day NASA dropped the, uh, well, not the NASA, FedEx brought the robot with NASA engineers, obviously, uh, and uh, both, you know, um, uh, Professor Yanko, uh, myself, and students were uh, at the nerve center. Uh, this is when the robot was put together. It was installed, and it was given to us. So. Um, Another disclaimer here is that uh, we didn't spend much time with this robot yet. I mean, when you make a good friend, new friend, you, it takes time to get to know that new friend, correct? So we are still trying to become good friends with this, with this robot, and, and um, we are looking forward to the next two years and, and beyond uh, to be able to do that. I will now take you back to um, January um, of this year, where we deployed a team of um, students and, and faculty uh, to Johnson Space Center. This is the mission control room for Apollos at the JSC, Houston, Texas. Uh, you can see the mission patches on the, on the walls, and uh, this was during a tour. Uh, but um, uh, the makers of the project, you know, the students, they spent a couple weeks um, together with the NASA engineers. They learned everything about the robot so, they can, so that we can get started with it uh, rapidly. Now let's go back to almost a year ago. Again, you know, NASA doesn't come and say, here, you know, we will give you a robot, right? So um, I was thinking, you know, how do I tell this story? You know, last summer, you know, everyone is on vacation. I am um, uh, somewhere in this vicinity, um, early August, and, you know, here is Boston, uh, and we are hastily writing a proposal to NASA saying that, you know, please select us because we have the expertise, we have the facilities, we have the um, manpower to do that. And then about a month earlier, um, three of us, you know, the, 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 the profs got together at an undisclosed location, no, <laughs> um, uh, here in Cambridge, and then we said, let's do this, and let's um, team up because we have this, uh, we have distinct expertise that we can bring to the team, and, and, and I'll talk about those very briefly, uh, and let's do it. Assuming so far, so good. You know, I'm not going too fast or too slow. So now I will, um, uh, the, the, the story will change slightly because story will be more biased towards, you know, you know what I've done in the past um, uh, few years uh, with humanoid robots, because this is a new um, field, um, and, and uh, it's, at, at, it's at the cusp of, you know, taking off. So I'll start with this video. This is um, early June 2015. Um, how many of you heard of the DARPA Robotics Challenge? DARPA Robotics Challenge, great. So this is pretty much the same idea, a humanoid robot that you see. It's called Atlas, built by a company here in Massachusetts, Boston Dynamics. Um, both by Google, um, a, a, a humanoid robot for disaster response. Um, so this was uh, inspired by the Fukushima disaster in Japan, uh, and DARPA uh, in 2012, you know, almost a year after the disaster, said that what if we had uh, robots that we could send in to the disaster site, and within the first hour we were able to turn on some valves and release the hydrogen that was built up in the, in the buildings and, um, and, um, and do things so that, the, so that we can respond to the, to the disaster sooner and, 
and uh, the consequences are, are more manageable. Um, they, they, well, thanks to all of you because this was a taxpayer-sponsored uh, program, obviously, right? So DARPA, when, when they invest in uh, research, so uh, a lot of teams, 20, 24 teams competed from around the world um, uh, last year in June um, to be able to do some of the tasks that are relevant to disasters. You know, what did you see? You saw the robot driving a modified vehicle, correct? And then the robot egressed the vehicle, opened the door, entered the building. At that point, you know, for those of you who are, uh, you know, wondering about the technicalities, the communications went bad between the robot and the, and the garage. So there's, a, there's an entire room of people trying to control this robot. But then communications, when the communications go bad, that means robots should be able to still keep going you know, during um, those blackouts. Then robot um, went in, uh, turned the valve. Uh, I will show you a close up of those. Turn the valve, um, cut a wall, use the, or, or turn the switch, and so on, and then Climb up the stairs, mission accomplished, ta-da. Um, the story here is, you know, my students said, okay, let's just cut the video before we take down the robot. I said, no way, because people have to see how many people it takes to bring down one humanoid robot from the top of three, four stairs, right, when, when it's done. So um, those of you who want to ask me the question, and ask me the question again at the end, uh, that, okay, so should we be, should we be afraid that you know, the, the humanoid robots will take over the world one day? You know? um, the answer is just you know, a firm no at this point. Not in our lifelines, I don't think that, that that's going to happen. But um, this was uh, the, the um, result of a three-year project that we worked on, and hundreds of people worked on this. Um, to be able to complete that one mission scenario. What did you see in the, um, uh, in the video? You saw a disaster with pretty clear you know, flooring, right? I mean, there was some rubble, but that was nicely dropped cinder blocks, correct? And then uh, the things that you don't know, the valves were uh, modified so it's easier to turn. You know, doors were modified so when you open it, they open up, you know, easily. things like that. So uh, why am I saying this, right? So I'm not downlooking the, the, the challenge or I'm not trying to um, uh, uh, say that you know, this wasn't worth it. Why I'm, what I'm trying to make the case is that you know, when we got this robot earlier in November, we got really, really excited because we said, look, we have a ton of work to do for these systems really to be able to do some of the exciting things that we want them to do. Uh, so let's just keep pushing hard. So we are not there yet, but we'll get there. So as I said, you know, this was, um, uh, modify, uh, this was uh, motivated by the Fukushima disaster. This is an aerial view. Uh, I took a tour of the site. You know, I was um, in a bus. Uh, these are the reactors, so this is reactor one, which was blown up, and so on and so forth. And I think disaster response makes a lot of sense for robotics applications. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying in robotics community, if a job is dull, dirty, and dangerous, or one of those, uh, it's a good job for robots. Okay, um, here's another quick video where you will have a, um, you know, uh, closer view on some of those tasks, but I have a question. The earlier video was obviously sped up, right? So it was running faster. What was the X factor, do you think? How many, how many times faster did I run that video? Ten. 10 times faster? Anyone else? 100 times faster? It was 20 times faster, okay? So the whole mission took about um, an hour, 56 minutes, to be, to be accurate. Uh, and then the idea is that the same mission, a human can, can complete it in a couple minutes. So that means we still have a long ways to go um, if you want human-like capabilities. Okay, I'll skip over this, and I'll get to this. So what are we trying to do again with Valkyrie? Um, so this is a, a, a closer look at the Atlas. So that's the um, uh, earlier human, humanoid robot that uh, we worked on. Um, and again, we are still 
carrying on with the, with the story, right? So we are going back in time. So this is now um, uh, the summer of 2013. Okay, summer of 2013. And um, at that time, we found out that you know, we were selected to work on this, this competition. Uh, and um, my daughter was almost a year old. The picture is not my daughter. I grabbed it from the internet. But, uh, but what my point is that uh, I heard that you know, since we were, we were talking, you know, will it be Padir's daughter walking first or the robot walking first? Now, my daughter was a late walker. You know, she walked around 14 months or so, but she still walked you know, sooner than the robot. And then more importantly, when she falls, she can get up and keeps going again, right? So that's <laughs> So um, you know, what you will see, you know, we'll show you the robot today, not in a, in a, in a static mode uh, like this. You know, there will be a demo. Uh, but uh, I want you to understand that we got this robot um, only about a month ago. And, uh, what we are trying to do is to take these baby steps, you know, in terms of uh, making her walk, making her to hold on to things and, and, and manipulate things. So our new challenge, our new baby is Valkyrie, although she looks somewhat intimidating when you get closer to her and, and so on. Um, I will close up the DARPA Robotics Challenge story by showing you a video um, of some of the robots from the, from the challenge. Um, this was a great community. You know, we worked with every single team during the competition. Um, uh, this is publicly available, obviously. This is on YouTube. But um, I'm showing you the uh, video of falling robots from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, and, and I think this will, this will take away, if you're still afraid that one day, you know, or, or you know, soon robots will take over the world, I think this video will, will help you with that. But from a research perspective, from a research perspective, perspective we know that uh, we need to keep working hard on these platforms, we need to keep working hard on uh, these systems so they can be useful. Um, We always get the question, I know, <laughs> maybe I'll let you enjoy the, <laughs> enjoy the video first and then, you know, <laughs> um, we'll continue. <clears throat> so one thing, one thing I need to mention, uh, one thing I need to mention is that um, these are all human controlled robots, right? So they have certain levels of autonomy. Uh, they can, you know, you, most of you saw the sensors um, that Valkyrie has, right? So um, uh, the, the vision sensor, uh, the LiDAR, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's a human supervision, a human operator. We don't operate them joint by joint. You know, you try not to move every single joint so that the, end of, you know, that the hands get to a point. Uh, but you can, you still send high level commands and there are things that humans are good at. You know, when, when I look at the room, I can sense where the doors are, you know, I can associate things very easily. Uh, so humans are good at that and robots can do low level calculations, right? So they can solve optimization problems, they can figure out things. So we try to merge the, merge, merge the two together. Um, I want to emphasize that, you know, again, this was an international competition and a lot of people worked on uh, these systems. And then we always get the question, why a humanoid robot? You know, why, why can't you use a wheeled robot in this case or you know, do things? There were some robots that were wheeled. Um, the answer that, that um, I like and, and, and I believe is that when we design our environments, when we design our buildings, homes, factories, spacecrafts, and so on, they are designed for humans, right? So we won't change the design of an aircraft that's gonna take the equipment to Mars because we're gonna put a wheeled robot inside the aircraft. Probably, maybe we'll change, but you know, the idea is that if these robots will perform those useful tasks in um, human environments, then legs and arms and, and a human-like form factor makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. So we can come back to this and, and uh, discuss later on. Again, going back in time, so I took you back to 2013, 2012, 2013, so that's uh, four or five years ago. Um, 
And uh, prior to that, we've been working on uh, wheeled robots uh, doing some similar tasks, right? So this is um, uh, one of our earlier robots um, where the robot autonomously finds a sample, finds something that doesn't fit with the environment. It's the little white pipe with a nice hook. I don't know which alien put that on, on the surface of that planet, but um, it sees and it says, okay, this is something that I want to pick because you know, my humans might be interested in that and, and uh, takes it and stores it. So this was a fully autonomous um, operation, knows where the object is, um, finds its location, deploys the arm, picks it up and stores it safely and, and so on. Uh, and again, I showed you only one you know, um, uh, use case. Uh, this was uh, part of the NASA's uh, uh, Sample Return Robot Challenge. Uh, so this was another NASA um, sponsored, this is another NASA sponsored program. Um, it takes place here in, in Massachusetts. Um, it's competition for um, rovers for autonomous sample collection. Uh, we participated in this, you know, we developed capabilities, you know, perception, you know, how do you know if something doesn't fit, you know, how do you know what to pick or where to pick from, right, after you identified it. A few years earlier th than that, in 2012, uh, this picture was taken at the Johnson Space Center, Houston, Texas. Uh, we took design, build, and uh, um, took another robot. Uh, this robot was um, controlled from a distant control station, very much so Earth, Mars um, scenario, teleoperated, and then it went around this rock yard, which is a uh, uh, Mars simulant in, in uh, Johnson Space Center, and then it found different colored rocks and collected them as samples and so on and so forth. Um, a year earlier, this is 2011-2010, uh, and this is actually when I started my um, uh, first tenure track position uh, and when we first launched our uh, research lab. Uh, this is a, a picture from um, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, where we are participating in the NASA's Desert Rats uh, testing event. And you see three robots here, or three um, vehicles. Here is R2, which is an uh, earlier version of R5. Um, that this robot is now in the International Space Station. Here's an SCV, it's a um, uh, surface exploration vehicle uh, designed by NASA. And then here's our robot. You know, it doesn't look like a robot, but it was the very first attempt from our research lab, let's, let's go and do something. Let's go and uh, do something in uh, exploration. Okay, with that, I hope I was able to give you an idea about you know, how did, did Valkyrie end up here? Okay, so it was a uh, multi-year multi effort, multi-year uh, research, and multi multiple institutions, multiple pe people. So, uh, and again, I happen to be the messenger today. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the project, a little bit about, more about the robot. I know that you interacted with the students and asked questions, and you still have a chance to do that. But this robot is one of the state-of-the-art systems. Um, it has um, multiple degrees of freedom. When I say a degree of freedom, so here's the degree of freedom, right? When we bend our elbow, for example, you know, we can control this separately, so this is a degree of freedom. A wrist is a degree of freedom. So Valkyrie's each arm has seven degrees of freedom. It allows the robot to do things like this, right? So when she's holding on to an, an, an object, you know, when, when keeping the end effector or keeping the hand stationary, she can still move the arm around. That additional degree of freedom helps us. Uh, each leg has six degrees of freedom, so we can take really interesting steps. Um, hands are one of the most interesting and exciting parts of this platform. Uh, each hand has uh, four fingers. Again, this might be one of the questions, why four fingers, not five? Then I will give you a homework. Uh, when you, you know, wake up tomorrow and you're preparing your breakfast, see how many times you use your last two fingers separately, okay? So they usually go together when we do tasks, so, you know. Um, but the idea is, you know, each hand has six degrees of freedom. It is not again, I mean, it's, it's a step towards human-like hands, but 
still not there. Um, and it has a lot of sensors. So now this is an earlier uh, version of um, Valkyrie. By the way, Valkyrie was also a participant at the DARPA Robotics Challenge, and she uh, competed um, in December 2013. Uh, but she has a bunch of cameras. You know, you saw uh, the sensors. She has a lot of sensors. You saw the cameras, the spinning lidar, which gives us the distances. It's very important, right? So. Um, for a robot to be able to go around and not hit obstacles, we better understand, we better know how far away those obstacles are and so on and so forth. And this all has to happen in computation. She has three computers on uh, her chest, and then we can also connect to her uh, through the tether. You see the black cable, so that's a power and uh, communi communications tether. Um, with the blue Ethernet cable, so we can also control her from a from external um, computer. Um, again, I'm sure I'm missing things. You know, she has sensors at the uh, bottom of her feet, so she knows when the feet on is on the ground versus it's on um, air. She has joint measurement sensors, so we know what the angle for each joint is. So everything has to be, you know, those of you who really want to know the details. Everything mathematically has to be calculated, figured out so that she can, she can complete tasks. Now, what we would like to do is, though, um, start adding uncertainties and unknowns into the equation, right? So yes, we can program the robot to take this many steps, but what happens if the world changes, right? But if, what happens if the environment changes? Um, or maybe she understands how to turn one valve and then can she figure out how to turn another kind of a valve um, if that's, that's needed? All right. Um, what are our goals in this project, right? So in the, for the next, looking into now the next two years. First of all, this is now a um, still small, but um, highly vibrant community of collaborators. So uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center is at the lead and uh, Northeastern UMass Lowell team, uh, together with MIT and University of Edinburgh, uh, they have their own robots. Uh, we are establishing a tight collaboration around the robot. How cool is that? Uh, everybody will bring in their secret sauce. It's not secret, by the way. We write publications and we publish papers. Uh, but secret sauce um, to make this system more advanced in the, in the next few years. Uh, this program was open to DARPA Robotics Challenge participants, so we are bringing our expertise from the past that I hope I was able to share with you um, in humanoid robot control in performing those tasks, uh, mobility, manipulation, perception, and human-robot interaction as well as interfaces. Um, there is a challenge it's called Space Robotics Challenge, and I will, I will uh, give you more details on that. But for that Space Robotics Challenge, there will be some space-related tasks, um, and we will try to validate those before the competitors, before co the competition teams really tries to um, perform those. But I think this is one of, the, uh, one of the slides that I'm most excited about. I talked about Team Northeastern UMass Lowell, and we are three professors, and each one of us bring in a uh, different uh, research expertise. So we will look at constraint motion control. What that means is, again, you know, if, if, you're holding, if the robot is holding onto a rail as she climbs down um, an, a habitat, right, stairs, um, how do you plan the motions? How can we program it so that uh, she doesn't fall and still comes down and, and so on? Um, uh, Professor Platt from Northeastern is focusing on perception-based grasping. I have a video coming up on that. You know, what that means is you, know, you can look at the clutter, the robot can look at the clutter and figure out, okay, I'm gonna pick up this object this way, pick up that object that way. It is very important and essential capability uh, for, this to, for this robot to develop. And then uh, Professor Yanko will, will focus on human-robot intera human interaction techniques. Um, we see that this robot will have a lot of on-Earth applications as well. Yes, NASA's mission is space exploration, and, and we are uh, contributing to this, this uh, vision, uh, but similar robots will be applicable in uh, disaster response, healthcare, 
uh, and all sorts of uh, different on Earth applications. So um, they will be near humans, either astronauts or us. They will be near humans, so we need to develop those HRI techniques. Um, and then, you know, we will make this platform available to the broader research community, right? So this is, this is one of the exciting, another exciting aspect of the project is um, maybe some research team or maybe a citizen scientist, you know, maybe some of you, um, you have an idea and you really think that that idea should be tested, tested on this platform. Um, then you reach out to us and we make that happen. That's, um, yeah, you know, sometimes I say that, you know, this is, um, this is a public robot, right? So uh, citizen scientists, other researchers will have access to this uh, through the competition or through um, other ways. What are some of the, again, space robotics challenge? Uh, very briefly, um, this will happen, uh, a, a, a virtual challenge will happen maybe May, May 2017, so there's still time. It's a year from today. Um, those of you who are interested, you know, should start thinking. But the idea is, okay, so this robot will exit a habitat airlock, airlock hatch. What is needed? Well, autonomy, perception, right? So robot has to look and locate where the um, hatch is, where the airlock is, walk and exit. Um, it should move. It should manipulate, you know, both grasping and non Prehensile, and it should be able to do it repetitively. So this was our um, you know, evaluation, early, early on evaluation. Use a ladder to reach the surface, remove, attach a cable. Uh, one thing I did not mention, um, but the presentation is not over yet, so I can mention it still. Um, the, the communication blackouts, right? So I mentioned that at the DARPA Robotics Challenge, you know, as soon as we entered the building, robot lost communication with its humans. If we try to operate this robot from Earth when she's on Mars, that's a 20 minutes one-way signal communications, okay? So you say, robot, move your hand, and then you go get your coffee, or you're gonna have breakfast, and then come back and see if the hand moved, uh, maybe moved, but then it didn't move to the right position, right? So you have the, so I'm exaggerating, obviously. But the, the idea is that this robot must have autonomy capabilities performing those tasks, otherwise it's not practical to operate it from Earth. Um, and obviously we tied our validation uh, strategy to, um, to some of the tasks that we performed earlier. Um, how are we doing in terms of time? 7.03. Molly, we are good? Should I get to some math and science and physics and all that? <laughs> Um, okay, I want you to leave with really, really, you know, what, is, what are these researchers trying to do, right? So I want you to leave with uh, some basic understanding, right? So when we, you will see a demo, as I said. I'm looking over there and I think they're getting ready. You will see a demo and then, you know, it will be, uh, the lecture is about to finish, so just bear with me. Um, um, but even, uh, even opening a door and going through the door, which is, you know, how hard can that be, right? So we, um, it takes a lot of steps. So first of all, robot um, will need to step, will need to plan the steps, right? How do I walk? We have to tell the robot, okay, you take, you can take bigger steps first, you know, put your left foot here, right foot here, um, and that position yourself really well so that you can engage the, um, door handle and so on and so forth. So when we start writing the program to do this, what we do is we break it, um, don't try to understand the slide, but you know, I'm just trying to give you the idea. We try to break it into pieces first, right? We say, okay, so here are some subtasks. So we better figure out where the door is, where the door, you know, if you know where the door is, you can figure out where the door handle is, unless it's an alien-like door. Um, uh, and then you keep, you keep um, uh, you know, progressing through if something fails, you know, if one of these blocks fails, so what do you do, and so on and so forth. So it, it becomes an iterative process for the robot to execute. So we develop some perception um, capabilities, as I said. So this is, you know, finding a door in, a, in an environment, uh, finding the handle, and then how do you really reach and turn the handle also, right? So how do you do that? Um, 
especially when you're trying to balance at the same time and maybe one of your um, arms is holding on to something and you still need to uh, turn. So those are all uh, interesting, interesting problems for um, us to pursue. Uh, one thing that we learned was we have to do these tests not once, not twice, um, not 50 times. You know, to get to the reliability levels of 99.99, otherwise these robots will never go anywhere. 99.99, um, uh, we have to test them rigorously, we have to account for everything that can go wrong, that will go wrong. Uh, so it's, it's essential to develop those um, validation strategies. I talked about the um, grasping and I'll show, I'll also talk about a little bit on the um, uh, human robot interfaces. So um, again, this is one capability that we would like to uh, bring to Valkyrie. Um, well, this, this um, is the work of uh, Professor Platt. Um, and as you see, this is what the robot sees, right? A similar situation, you know, we have the sensors. And then um, his algorithms can develop, okay, so here is this object, um, and how do we approach that object to be able to grasp? And what's the pose uh, of the robot hand should be so that when we grip, uh, we pick it up? Uh, and he has been uh, doing this successfully in a cluttered area. So again, this is a very straightforward task for us humans, but for a robot, this is actually a very, very challenging task. Um, all right. And then I told you that, uh, and then you saw a few examples of this earlier in the, in the presentation. Uh, currently, multiple operators control one robot, and we still do that. Um, and you know, multiple computers, everybody looking at one different screen. And by the way, each one of those screens will have, you know, don't try to read again the slides, but you know, what's, what is that angle? What is, where is the center of mass? Where is that one point that we really worry about so we don't fall? Um, you know, all the data is condensed into, into these blocks, you know. Uh, it takes training, obviously, but this is not intuitive. This is not how we should do it, right? This is not how we strive to, to do it. So, um, again, um, we would like to develop better ways, you know. Can we have um, other um, interface gadgets, right? So, um, so that we can, um, we can control this complicated system, complex um, robot. With this, um, the lecture part of it is over, so the more fun part will begin. Um, we'll start with um, questions and answers, but I was, and I anticipated a few questions that you might ask, and then I answered some of them uh, earlier, so I have a few more. Um, so the first question that we get is, you know, are you guys competing? Is this a competition? You know, will there be a competition? So there will be a competition, but we are not competing. Actually, we cannot compete. Uh, it was part of the deal, but we make this platform available for the um, competing teams. Um, one of my favorite ones, will the robot go to Mars? Well, not this one, uh, because, you know, probably we'll get a very good use out of this. And this robot is not space hardened, right? But descendants of this robot you know, in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years might go. Again, we don't know. Uh, and this is, again, one of the favorites. I am a high school student. I am a practicing engineer. I am a, um, you know, fill in the blanks. Can I get involved? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, just reach out to us and let's discuss what makes sense. And that's all I always say. We already have a crew of um, high school interns joining us um, in a couple weeks when the schools are out. Uh, we have undergraduate students working on this at both institutions, at both Northeastern and UMass Lowell. Uh, we have PhD students, we have faculty just bragging about the project and so on. <laughs> but um, the answer is yes. Um, so before I switch to your questions, and you heard the robot to power on, so we'll, um, we'll get started with that. But um, um, I want to first of all thank the, the team who made today possible. So again, uh, let's give a hand to the students, including <laughs> lab students. Um, 
excellent. I want to thank Molly uh, and the whole um, uh, Office of uh, Alumni Relations for inviting us here and, and hosting us. Um, and I'm going to say hi to my kids and my wife who are watching the webcast in Worcester. Hello, everyone. And I'll be, I'll be late tonight, but I'll be there, you know, hopefully uh, um, once we pack up the robot and put, it, put it her back into the uh, cases. With this, I'm going to open, open it up to your questions as we get ready for the, um, uh, for the demo. Yes. Just uh, since the webcast, you know, if you... Yes. I'd like to know what role, if any, synthetic dopamine has in, in connecting the dots and, and, and having a robot move in a, in a fashion that is forward-looking. So um, forward-looking, as I said, you know, I just tried to give you a, a, an idea about you know, what should happen in terms, you know, piece by piece. By piece. Um, so, of course, we get the question, you know, the artificial intelligence, right? So um, where does it come into picture? So... Our current focus in the first few years is to develop the capabilities um, at the task execution level, right? So this robot should be able to open a door. This robot should be able to walk without falling over obstacles, for example. Um, let's first take those challenging, still challenging tasks. And then at the decision-making level, yes, absolutely. You know, we, we are not going to uh, pre prescribe those motions, right? So robot will have to calculate things. You know, is this door a door that I know? You know, so there will be intelligence um, that needs to be developed uh, on the robot side. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a combination of the two. I mean, dopamine is, 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 is a synthetic enzyme that, that helps connect things. It's not necessarily the brain or that which, you know, Yes. Solves problems and things like that. Yes. I mean, as, as you follow, there is, uh, there's a lot of effort that's happening on machine learning as well as, you know, deep learning now that, you know, we have a better computational system. So uh, we want this robot to learn based on the data that, that um, she will collect. So you're Another question, yes. So you're not competing, but then you're working with a few other that's correct. universities on these basic, the, some of the basic tasks. That's correct. So we are not competing, but we, this is a collaborative research effort with NASA and other uh, participating universities. Question over there. Hello. Um, it appears that a lot of the, the development is in software um, with autonomous control, but uh, would you say that the, the dynamic um, control software is all sorted out and now you just work on the sort of intelligence and autonomous stuff, or are you still tuning the dynamics, the control? It's algorithms? the latter. So we are still tuning, tuning the low-level controllers, and we are hoping that we will be able to uh, uh, make advancements on that level as well. Right? So, um, okay, so what to expect from the demo? I'm not going to tell you what the robot will do, um, but it's very likely that you will see, well, I should say likely, but it's possible that robot might fall during one of those steps. Uh, well, you see there is a, there is a uh, infrastructure that's going to keep robot from falling. So that fall is not going to be. So remember the picture, you know, how we hold our kids you know, as they walk? So we catch the robot, and it's not going to fall to the ground. But um, we are, again, within the scope, yes, we will be focusing on software development. However, we are already looking at if we were to design something similar. Right? If NASA wants to design the next generation, what are the things that, um, that should be considered, right? So that's definitely in our minds. We are all engineers and scientists, and uh, we want to see ed, you know, even more advanced uh, hardware platforms. And I'm going to refer you to uh, what Boston Dynamics did with their next version of Atlas you know, after they uh, uh, gave away, basically, or they, they provided the first Atlas to many research teams. Yes, question. So the question is, do we have a specialized CPU or is it something that we can buy from um, um, Amazon or, you know, yes. So th this has standard computers. So this robot has standard computers. So um, it's not specialized. But as I said, you know, whatever, we, whatever computation that fit inside the robot is there. But then we can have more computers running 
Uh, we are even thinking, you know, can we use cloud computing to do some of the, um, you know, heavy computation so that that runs um, and then the information is sent to the robot. Now, one of the, uh, as, as I was giving a similar presentation at the uh, PI meeting uh, back in January, uh, you know, I was, I was focusing on, you know, for disaster response, we have to be fast and so on and so forth. But one of the program managers at NASA said, you realize that this robot doesn't have to be that fast, right? Because we are sending this robot, you know, again, hypothetically, um, as a pre-deployment uh, asset to Mars, and the task might be, okay, so here's a panel that collected dust, wipe it off, and robot might want to do that in what? In a day, maybe, right? So the, 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 um, the point is, depending on what, what needs to happen, you know, the, how fast we do it, you know, how fast should the robot do it is relative, in a sense. Yes, there was a question here, yes. What is, I'm sorry, what is different about this platform in terms of strength, flexibility, and stability versus all prior platforms? Um, so I, I have one you know, strong data point that I can compare to. You know, I work with the Atlas robot prior. Uh, Atlas was, those of you, you know, who are mechanical engineers, was hydraulically actuated. Um, so it was more powerful, faster, but this is all electric with um, uh, serious elastics at the joints. Um, so we are happy that we don't keep a mop in our uh, laboratory to clean the hydraulic <laughs> fluid. Um, but again, um, more than the single actuation units, um, packaging everything, packaging 44 actuators into one uh, robot form is the advancement at this point. Uh, we have more degrees of freedom than, um, uh, than some of the existing humanoid robots um, and more sensing capabilities on board. Did I answer your question? Maybe I'll look this way and then you know, I'll come back to you. All right, so one question there. So I know you mentioned there's a lot of uh, standard hardware components in there, um, and I'm sure all the development they're doing with the other schools will eventually be compiled into some master software package. Is, is there a plan to make that open source and available to the community? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the whole plan is to make whatever is developed, because it's being developed by your tax dollars, uh, it will be made available. And NASA actually has a vision that this system will be an open hardware, open software system at some point. Uh, but you know, assuming, uh, you know, from your question, I gather that you, know, you, you are in, in, in the field or in a closely related field. Um, open system or open hardware, open software doesn't mean that it's all good, right? So we have to make sure that it's really replicable in terms of what we provide. You ready? We're all set. Okay, so we are going to see the demo. Uh, you'll see the robot to take a few steps and so on and so forth, and we'll come back to the Q&A because I hope that the, the demo will uh, trigger some questions. <coughs> Drum roll, music? No, I don't know. <laughs> You hear the fans of the computing, you know, co uh, the, the, uh, at, at the joints and, and the computers. All right, as we reset, any other questions? Yes. You 
gyros. The question is, do we use gyros uh, in the robot? Yes, the robot has multiple gyros. What's the weight of the robot? Robot weighs about 275 pounds. Heavy. We'll reset and try again. What's the battery life? And uh, the question is, what is the battery life? Um, the robot doesn't have batteries right now. Power pack. Oh, yeah. uh, the power pack is a battery simulant, so it's just weight. Uh, we are running it through the gray box that you see over there, so it's connected to the, uh, to the cord. So, uh, NASA has a, is, is developing and has a, has a uh, prototype of a battery pack, and it can give uh, about an you know, hour plus, one hour, a little bit more than an hour uh, of run time, one to two hours. Question. You talked before about having a better than 99% reliability for the yes. robot. So if and when it ever goes to Mars, what is the self-diagnosis or redundancy capabilities, or where is that so, going as far as development? I did not make up that 99 point you know, percent uh, reliability. That was, uh, you know, during the PI meeting, you know, our NASA program manager mentioned that. So they evaluate every single technology that needs to be packed because every gram, every uh, pound that you add on the payload is not good, right? So, um, so again, that was may, my make of that 99.9 percent, .9%, but it, it is a realistic number, you know, NASA um, will, uh, look at that. You know, we'll it. So, it, it, are they thinking of a self-repair pro procedure? So, the idea. So, for example, when they when they build their spacecraft, they look at. So, there are redundant systems, right? So, um, I didn't show this, but yeah, if a, if a robot's one joint, let's say, fails, right, it can still perform some of the tasks. Um, we are not there. We are not at the point of self-repairing at this point. So, I'll be speculating on behalf of. NASA, <laughs> if I answer the question one way or another. Um, but definitely it will make sense, right? So, or maybe another robot fixing this robot, right? If I'm guessing it won't be a single robot um, in a mission or you know, multiple missions. So robots fixing robots is an interesting research proposal for us to think about, actually. <laughs> it seems like a lot of the uh, tasks that Valkyrie performs are really feed-forward dependent. Um, what, right, like planning out a route and steps to take and then figuring out a door and opening it, uh, to what extent is she capable of feedback mechanisms, like sensing when a fall is starting to recalculate her footing? So the question is, a lot of the tasks that I mentioned, like opening a door uh, and um, uh, turning a valve, you know, turn, you know uh, things like that, those are like feed forward. So it sounds like there is no feedback. Uh, but to what extent she's able to uh, do feedback, you know, in your, in your um, uh, question, such as you know, detecting falls and so on and so forth. We have that capability. Uh, we can detect falls, but what, um, you know, we, we've done that in, uh, in our earlier projects. But as I said, you know, imagine that you opened up your Christmas gifts and then you're into one week of your enjoying your toy, right? So you're, we're trying to, we're not there yet, but definitely... Um, well, number one, we don't want robot to fall. So things that you can do is you can detect the fall because we already said that there are gyros uh, available. And then uh, one thing that you can do is you can freeze, right? So be before figuring out what to do. But then what do humans do? We take a sidestep and so on and so forth. Those are definitely the things that we would like to develop. Um, so hopefully you come back in six months or in a year, and then we'll be able to demonstrate those um, at that point. Any other questions? Yes? Can <laughs> okay, that's going to go on to my slides for the next presentation, definitely. Uh, can the robot talk? Um, no, she cannot talk unless we connect um, you know, a set of speakers. Um, does this answer your question? Did I disappoint you? Sorry. <laughs> We can make her talk, but not, not as a, she doesn't talk. Yes, you had a question from earlier. Yeah, my question was partially answered. What is the energy source? Uh, the other question is, what is the plan to recharge it on Mars when it goes to Mars? Oh, so, um, yeah. okay. So the question, what's the plan to recharge it on Mars? Um, again, uh, from a robotics perspective, you know, from what we know, I will say 
It's for NASA and others to figure out. I don't know, but you know, if you saw the movie Martian, right? It makes sense to have solar panels. It will make sense to have you know uh, some sort of a nuclear power supply somewhere there uh, that will that will help her recharge and go. Definitely, she will have short. I mean, I should say definitely, but you know, it will start with having short mission durations and go from there. Question over there. I'm just curious why Valkyrie is a female and are all um, humanoid robots females? And if so, why is that? So, well, um, so excellent. So the, the reason why Valkyrie is female is, you know, when we went to uh, NASA training, all NASA engineers were calling the robot her, she. So that's, it's their robot, right? So they designed it and we respect that and that's, uh, that's actually very cool. And I showed you pictures of Atlas. Do you associate Atlas with, as, a, as a female humanoid robot? It, so, you know, um, after a while, you know, after, you know, um, our students spend so many hours and overnight, you know, work on, on these projects, uh, they, you get closer to them. And then we don't want to call our robots it. You know, we don't, you know, we, we name them. Um, so Valkyrie is a she, and, and we are happy about that. So let's see what happens now. Actually, I was very happy that you saw how the robot fell in the earlier demo. I'm not trying to make up, but, you know. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Are you accounting for differences in gravity or lack thereof? The question is, are we accounting for differences of gravity? Um, the short answer is no. Is it doable? Yes, it's doable. Uh, but again, as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, you saw uh, we need to develop the capabilities first. But at this time, we have to, right? So. So following on that uh, gentleman's question about feedback, yeah. um, I noticed two antennas on the back of Valkyrie. Are you collecting valuable telemetry uh, uh, from one of those antennas? Absolutely. We log data with every single fall, and then we go back and analyze what happened. You know, what was the reason for this? Was it a, you know, um, a joint that reached its limit, and so on and so forth? Absolutely. I mean, it's a learning process for us engineers uh, uh, working on this, on this project, too. Question. Uh, the question is, do you think this information can be used for military purposes? Now, um, can you elaborate a little bit more, more on that? So Mission rescue, of course, would be, you know, it's key, but I mean, I know, I know it's a far-fetched, but like, you know, like, you know, you, you see all the sci-fi movies like that, but beyond that, like, <coughs> using humanoids on battlefields. So, so the question, okay, so we used to get that question a lot, you know, when we worked on the, uh, on the Atlas. So 
can the humanists be used on um, as, as soldiers? You know, um, and, and um, I don't think so. Um, you know, my personal opinion, and you know, that's not how we, you know, why we do this research. Um, uh, we are, as I said, and as I tried to say, you know, we are really excited about the exploration uh, timeline that's ahead of us, and that's going to keep us busy. Uh, but of course, you know, I mean. Um, Technology is technology, right? So it's only um, um, your imagination how you want to use it. Um, so I'll leave it there. Any other questions? Yes. Have you experienced a 100% year, 100% fail rate on any activity? And if so, does that pose a fail one test all the time? So the question is, uh, is there one task that the robot fails all the time? Uh, and my answer is, I don't know. We don't know yet, uh, because we didn't have a chance to run uh, that extensive test with this robot, robot yet. But I'll uh, capture your uh, question, put it in my chest, and uh, we'll get back to you. Because, um, but, then, but more importantly, um, how do you make sure that the software doesn't crash, right? I mean, for those of us who are developing code, and so, how do you make sure that your computers uh, doesn't give you the blue screen all of a sudden, and then what happens at that point? But and going back to one of the earlier questions, redundancy and um, and development of um, um, reliable software is essential, obviously. Um, things go wrong. Right? I mean, these are machines, you know, we have cars and things go wrong, and um, we just have to work harder to, to make sure that every, every uh, case is covered. It's challenging, it's challenging. Over there. How would you make Valkyrie ready for space and how would that affect her dynamics as she moves? How do we make um, Valkyrie ready for space? Um, again, I'll take the uh, you know, easy answer, I guess, here because uh, it's not the main focus right now. Um, definitely, she needs to be you know, space hardened, right? So you know, the components that you put in should be uh, radiation hardened and, and so on and so forth. You know, if you come around, you see a lot of holes uh, for ventilation purposes because we want to keep uh, the airflow reasonably so it doesn't, uh, things don't over, overheat. Um, it will affect the dynamics, but again, you know, we have a lot of simulation tools where we can um, reliably test things um, here before before uh, the deployment. Does this answer your question to some extent? Excellent. Any other questions back there? You showed examples of opening a doorknob or dusting something off, more fine motor skills. What type of lifting capacity or brute strength does, the, does she have? Uh, Again, uh, we have not done any extensive testing on that, so we don't know. But um, um, yeah, a three hundred pound robot. Um, I wish I, I I could say yes, we can lift twenty pounds. Um, I don't know, but again, that's a question that uh, that we will um, have to come back and answer for you. Uh, we know she's powerful. We know she's going to hurt if she hits you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? I'm just wondering about the humorous part. We saw her wave. Are there other components that you've sort of integrated in Valkyrie that are humorous and human-like? Humorous and human-like uh, behaviors? Um, any one of the students wants to take this? No, they are not, they are not paying attention. Um, well, Holly? Not intentionally. That's a great answer. Not intentionally. Um, why did you ask? You know, I'm just now curious. Maybe, maybe it's something. Yes. Human-like robots. Human experience. Human -like robots, you human just experience. gave a wave. Yes. That's a very human-like response. Yes. You didn't have to do that, but you did. Yes. So I was just uh, wondering about other. Well, aspects. frankly speaking, that was one of the low-hanging fruits for today's demo for us, right? So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I wish there was a complicated panel here and the robot starts, you know, pulling the cards and then putting things back in. Well, maybe next year, you know, uh, you know if, if, we, uh, if we do this again. So, um, 
But I mean, it's, you know, we talked about human-robot interaction, right? So definitely there is the social aspect and uh, aspects that we should think about. Any other questions? One more question I was noticed back there. I'm curious to know, um, is there any way that we'll be able to look online to find out how the progress is going? Yes. I'm glad that you asked, and that's a very nice segue. Uh, so follow our progress at src.nu.edu. Uh, and uh, again, you know, our uh, marketing offices, you know, at both institutions have been uh, doing a great job with posting, keeping us on our toes, you know, as soon as we get something, you know, valuable, it's posted um, somewhere. So yes, absolutely, Keep, you know, um, you'll hear about Valkyrie uh, in the next couple of years and then beyond, I'm hoping. One more. Is there a message for the young engineers that are in the room that you would like to send? Yes. Thank you. Is there a message that you would like to uh, share with the young engineers that will be there 20 years from now? Yes. Well, you saw, make it happen, right? So because uh, this is your generation, this, you, know, you, you will be the engineers and scientists uh, that, that will seek this through and then see this through and then uh, make it happen, definitely. Um, yeah, sometimes you know, computer games are better than you know, doing the math homework, but you know, knowing math is also important. But then keep playing those games because those are also uh, giving you some other you know, um, technical skills maybe. My son heard me. <laughs> anyway, good, one more? Oh, excellent. All right, well maybe we'll do it that one. I'd like to know if Valkyrie will come clean my house. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Padir, Dr. Yanko, and the entire team for being here with us tonight. How about if we give them one more round of applause? <laughs> my name is Lori Jakes, and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations. And before we end this evening, I just wanted to thank you all for joining us both here in person and those of you who are online. As Molly mentioned earlier tonight, programs like this one are a great opportunity for us to showcase our talented faculty and their research. And it also, they also allow us the opportunity to connect with each of you. As we say goodnight, I'd like to invite you each to um, either speak to myself or any of my colleagues who are here in this room whether you're an alum, you're a parent, you're a student, please let us know what we can do to keep you connected to Northeastern and, and how we can make your experiences even better. I, I really hope before you leave, you do come up to one of us and let us know because this is how we can provide this level, this type of programming that we have here tonight. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great night and I hope to see you soon.